Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode where we talk all news, comics, and media related to the... On this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we launch a brand new contest and the only thing you should be asking yourself right now is, are you a Donatrion? We review Transformers Lost Light issue 22 and Entertainment Weekly has a piece on Transformers voice actor Frank Welker, Megatron himself. No, I mean Soundwave himself. No, I mean Mirage himself. No, I mean Ravage himself. No, I mean Rumble himself. No, I mean Gro- Groove. That's it, Groove. The voice actor behind Transformers most beloved character, Groove. Today is Friday, August 31st, 2018, and this is episode 92 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast whose worldwide promo tour began this July. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team. Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hey, how you doing? And Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. Hello, everybody. Let's talk Transformers. All right. And uh, before we start the show, I do want to mention something. We already mentioned it in the main transmissions show, but I want to say it again because it is uh, very cool. And that might be more relevant to listeners of alt mode uh, because we have our friend of the show and co-host of Podcast Maximus, Marion. And she is running an auction to support the organization IDAS or IDAS that helps and supports women who are trying to get out of abusive and violent relationships in the UK. So it's a, you know, a charity uh, organization. And uh, she is auctioning off postcards that feature her photography that she got signed at TF nation. And they were signed by Stan Bush, Nick Roche, Kay Zama, Jack Lawrence, and James Roberts. And all the postcards feature her photography of uh, different figures she was selling them at tf nation and now she's selling these ones these special ones that were signed by the artists Uh, and you can win them in a blind auction Uh, the auctions are starting at a bid of 10 pounds and uh, it'll be run by fellow uh, podcast maximus co-host Stuart webb and his twitter uh, so to build in the auction, you got to uh, send him a direct message on Twitter at uh, he is at inflatable Dalek, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And uh, you got to send in your bid by the uh, by September seventh, and they extended the auction for us so that we could help get the word out and uh, and give people more time to bid. Uh, so whoever gets the highest bid, and since it's a blind auction, you don't know what other people are bidding, but whoever bids highest. Uh, that they will get the uh, the cards and uh, it's you know there's there's several cards that you can bid on and all the money will go to IDAS uh, and Marion will make that donation. Uh, you can also email uh, Stuart at his email address uh, crazeweb at yakko.co.uk. We'll also link that in the show notes. So if you don't have Twitter, you can still bid in the auction just by sending That's a bid. Yahoo.co.uk. What did I say? Yakko. Oh, <laughs> I've been podcasting with you too long. <laughs> <laughs> It'll the right email address will be in the show notes. <laughs> Yahoo at dot co dot uk. Yeah, it'll be clickable in the show notes. Just do yes. that. Uh, also, you have to pay by PayPal, so uh, they only accept PayPal, uh, and you have to pay by September fourteenth. So yeah, check out those cards. We'll have links to pictures of the cards in the show notes as well. That's also on Twitter, so you can check that out. They're really cool uh, photography. Marion is a great uh, a great photographer. These cards are really cool, and getting them signed by all those artists is uh, makes them extra special. So definitely check those out, and it's going to support a really good cause. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, helping helping women in the UK. All right, uh, so let's move on and talk about our donations. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any new donations this week, uh, but we do want to give a shout out to our uh, supporter, Chad, who's also Sherlock Holmes, uh, in the Discord chat, and he made a Transmissions bin- Bingo game that all our Donatrons can play in the Discord chat. So the image is floating around there. 
you got to be a Donatrion to see it. Uh, although Chad might make it public if he posts it on his social media. Uh, if he does, we'll retweet him or, you know, share him, all that good stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's fun. You know, little in jokes for the podcast. Uh, lots of fun stuff. He uh, he did a great job. So uh, we don't have any new donations, but uh, we did. We are still giving away stuff to all our Donatrons. We want to congratulate Robbie who won our $10 Toy Hags gift code for the month of August. So congratulations, Robbie. Go buy something awesome at toyhags.com. There's lots of cool stuff there for you to get. Uh, stickers for all your figures. And we are running another contest coming up soon. So uh, in the first, uh, the first week of October, we are going to draw for... Uh, all of our G1 reissues. We have picked up several G1 reissues items that are coming out of Walmart, and we're going to give them away to three of our lucky Donatrion. So you got to be signed up as a Donatrion by September 30th. So if you go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support, that's where you can sign up. You can either sign up on Patreon or PayPal, and you will be entered to win either a G1 reissue Starscream, a G1 reissue devastator or a g1 reissue bumblebee so we're gonna have three prizes to give away in october so that's uh all the housekeeping stuff let's move on and talk about some comics news all right uh first up uh there is a new digital comic subscription service coming up and this is exclusive to the nintendo switch uh, and this is a service called Inky Pen. It's an, going to be an app on the Switch that start, that's going to be available November 2018. Uh, it's going to be $7.99 a month for access to all digital comics. So it's a Netflix-style service, so similar to Comixology Unlimited. Got over 10,000 digital comics. Uh, and the publishers listed are IDW, Dynamite, Valiant, Humanoids, uh, also some French comics. Uh, I guess Humanoids is a French comic publisher, and Manga is also going to be on there too. Uh, I I wanted to highlight this because in the uh, YouTube ad video that they have, they show screenshots from Transformers R.I.D. number one. So definitely Transformers will be in this subscription service. I'm a little bit, I mean, even though I do own a Nintendo Switch, I'm a little skeptical about a service that's only available on the nintendo switch that's not the best i mean it's it's not a huge screen not the best for reading digital comics but they seem it to did say it would is... work if it's docked in, in tv mode right. yeah i guess yeah that that's really strange but also the dc streaming service that's coming up also has mentioned that they're gonna have like a mode for reading comics on tvs and i'm just like that's, that's so weird I mean, it's it's weird because also because I when I first saw this news item, I was like, oh, I, I guess Ink Pen is something that already exists that I never heard of, and it's probably available on all other devices like you know tablets and uh, computers and desktops or whatever. But no, this is only for the Switch, nothing else. So that's that's slightly odd, uh, but more power to them. Uh, mm-hmm. Anything that that. Uh, has access to more Transformers comics I'm in favor. Hopefully some people will be able to discover more tra- good Transformers comics. But Yeah, so uh, we'll have links in the show notes if you're curious about how Inky Pen is going to work. Uh, you can check it out. And if you have a Switch, uh, you want to read comics on your Switch, uh, 8 bucks a month gets you lots of comics. No Marvel or DC, though. That's, <laughs> that's excluded, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, another bit of news we have... The cover for Star Trek versus Transformers number three, it features all the ladies. So it's got Windblade and RC along with Uhura. I think that's Nurse Chapel and then the cat lady who I am not familiar with. Lieutenant Mress. Ah, okay. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's actually in the description, so I should have just... I wasn't going to point that out. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah i'm sure if yoshi were here he would complain about windblade being there since it's supposed to be g1 but i think she's been grandfathered into the g1 canon i guess in the series so that's fine by me 
but I, it's it's just a cool cover to show like uh all the uh the ladies of the series uh still uh no word on, on you know any more what's coming up but it's we we've only got a couple more months before the the series kicks off all right and lastly we have solicitations for IDW in November 2018 uh, there are some spoilers here, as usual, but uh, it's interesting because it's not really a lot of Transformers stuff coming in November 2018. But we do have GoBots number one, the Tom Scioli joint. That's Ugh. coming uh, in <laughs> in November, so uh, that's going to kick off. And then we've also got the uh, Star Trek versus Transformers. Uh, that's number three, as I we just talked about the cover. And then uh, there's also another book uh, that's going to be Transformers Package Art Portfolio. So 10 lithograph prints of classic patch- packaging art from the Transformers toy line. So if you're interested, if you're really into the packaging art, you can check that out. So that's all the comics news for this week. So let's move on to our comic review. And this week we are doing Lost Light number 22, Crucible Part 4, The Return of the King. That's got to be a Lord of the Rings reference, right? Yeah, the the, <laughs> the Lost Light has made it to Mordor. <laughs> We're about to toss Rung in. Oh, so that's what he is. <laughs> yeah, he, he transforms into a ring. All right, written by James Roberts, art by Brendan Cahill, colors by Joanna LaFuente, Letters by Tom B. Long, editor David Marriott, publisher Greg Goldstein. And we have three covers this week. Cover A is by Nick Roche and Josh Bertram. Colors by Josh Bertram. It shows Chrome Dome carrying Rung in ornament mode and using him as something like a, looks like he's holding him like a chainsaw. A battering ram. Maybe, yeah doesn't actually happen in the issue but whatever <laughs> cover b by jeff senior with colors by josh bertram that's an amazing pair and it shows uh megatron and rodimus arguing not fighting but arguing with each other uh in that inimitable jeff senior style the retailer incentive cover is just the lines of cover a so it's just nick roche's lines so uh, jeremy which cover are you picking here I really like the lines, but I think cover A, the the coloring on that picture with Chrome Dome really does a lot for it. So that is what I'm going to choose. I will say I I like the Jeff Sr. one. It's just weird seeing his take on the modern styles of these characters. But the the cover A, just it's like very clean. I don't know. It's just... Something draws me to it. I really like it. All right, Daryl, uh, which cover are you picking? Uh, well, if uh, you recall, I missed out on cover A at my store uh, because it sold out before I got to it, but I did get Jeremy to pick it up for me at his. So I ended up with cover B. Um, not that I didn't like it. I think it's really good, but uh, cover A would have been the one I, I would have chosen. Uh, I got to say, I also am liking cover A, even though I am a big Jeff Sr. fan. I do like uh, his cover. I I especially like how they have the shadow covering uh, Megatron's chest so you can't see whether or not he still has an Autobot symbol. I think that's a nice touch. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do think cover A is is definitely, I think, the cleaner, cleaner, uh, more pleasing art for me. Uh, So, yeah. That's the covers. All right, let's get into the story for Lost Light number 22. Uh, Before we get into this issue, there are some major, huge spoilers, revelations. Like, this is a big one. If you are, you know, casually following along with the series and you don't want to know the big reveal, this, this is an issue with a pretty big reveal at the end. When we are going to talk about it and all its spoilery goodness. So, I mean, the, the issue's been out for about a month now. So if you haven't read it yet, uh, just go and read it before you come and, back here. But, and if you don't want to be spoiled, we have time codes and stuff. Just go to the next section and come back later. <laughs> yep. All right. Now, let's get into the story. Picking up from the end of Lost Light 21, 
Ultra Magnus and Rodimus are less than pleased to see Megatron returning from the Functionist universe, captaining a duplicate lost light painted purple at the head of an invading armada. They tell him as much over the comm channel. But Megatron protests. They've got it entirely wrong. Megatron's ship, the last light, isn't leading the, this attack fleet. It's fleeing from it, and the monster following through the portal behind. A giant, planet-sized robot emerges from the portal, hot on the last light's heels. No, not that giant, planet-sized robot. This one looks like Primus, and appears to be the alt mode of the Functionist Universe's Cybertron. Megatron gives him the full explanation. This is the realization of the Functionist's grand plan. They're using Cybertron as a weapon of mass destruction to cleanse the universe of non-Cybertronian life. Megatron's been fighting against them ever since he was stranded in the Functionist universe back in Lost Light number 6. Megatron tells Rodimus they need to meet so they can sync up, but Megatron can't get a fix on his location. Rodimus tells him they're inside the lead green Decepticon world sweeper among the fleet of Decepticon world, sweep world sweepers. Megatron asks the obvious question of why they're on a Decepticon World Sweeper in the first place, and Rodimus reluctantly tells him they've been captured. Megatron tells him to sit tight and he'll come and rescue them. Meanwhile, on the bridge of the World Sweeper, the Grand Architect and his lieutenants, Tyrest and Flame, watch the giant Primus bot destroy the Madiri moon and absorb its energy. Tyrest has noticed that his leader looks disturbingly like his former underling, Pharma, but they've got bigger concerns at the moment. The Grand Architect has been preparing for this event for millennia, and they've got three fleets ready to attack the Primus Planet monster. The Grand Architect gives the order, and the battle is joined. The World Sweepers, Black Block Consortia, and Infinite Transformers attack the Functionist Armada. The Grand Architect is pleased with the assault, planning to drive the monster back through the portal to its own universe. But Tyrest points out that the portal is closed and Primus has started attacking the Cybertron replicas that form the God Gun that opened the portal in the first place. When Tyrest asks what do they do now, the Grand Architect says he needs to see the prisoners, aka the crew of the Lost Light, immediately. Inside Vector Sigma at the center of Functionist Cybertron, the Functionist Council is directing the movements of Primus smashing the replica Cybertrons that are an affront to Primus's divine purpose. Despite the fact that they are trapped in a new universe with no way back home, and their hated enemy Megatron and his ship The Last Light survives, their mission remains clear. Cleanse the universe of all non-Cybertronian life. It's Primus's will. Back at the World Sweeper, Megatron's ship has arrived to rescue Rodimus and crew. But Megatron's rescue is going to be a bit bumpy. His ship fires a bank of, of missiles at the World Sweeper, breaching the hull to open space. This happens just at the moment the Grand Architect has come to talk to his prisoners, and he doesn't want them to leave. He orders his guards to open fire, and Drift is mortally wounded in the shoulder just before he's sucked out into the void of space with most of the other lost lighters. The Grand Architect engages the shield, sealing the hull, leaving Ratchet, Rodimus, Rung, Nautica, and Whirl still on the ship. Ratchet is pretty surprised to see that the en enigmatic Grand Architect is actually Pharma, who's supposed to be pretty dead. The Grand Architect explains that he's not Pharma, but he is using Pharma's body and spark, and Ratchet's presence is causing Pharma's personality to try and reassert itself. The Grand Architect explains that some time ago he was attacked by a space bridge, and when he reached through the other side to retrieve the attacker, he grabbed Pharma's headless body instead. Tyrest recognizes that what he's describing is the time he built a space bridge to Cyber Utopia, but the Grand Architect corrects him that the space bridge actually reached into his mind. Ratchet asks if he's not Pharma, who is the Grand Architect really? And he answers that in the beginning, he was known as Adaptus. Meanwhile, on the last light, Megatron greets his former crewmates. He's especially pleased to find the Scavengers, bona fide Decepticons, with them. The starstruck scavengers are surprised at the fact Megatron even knows who they are. But before Megatron can explain how he got here, he needs to tend to the seriously wounded Drift. Velocity wants to get him to the med bay immediately, but Megatron says there's no need. He removes his new fusion cannon, which actually turns out to be a portable medical kit and toolbox. 
Velocity points out that Drift's got a serious zero-point spark injury that can't be treated, but Megatron still insists on examining him. After working on him for a bit, he restores Drift to fully functioning status. Turns out Megatron has learned a few tricks hanging out in the Functionist universe. Ultra Magnus finally asks Megatron to explain what happened since they left, and he does. Megatron led the Anti-Vocationist League resistance against the Functionist Council, but he couldn't stop their complete takeover of Cybertron. They built engines into Cybertron's surface and used the Warren, the same nexus of space-time wormholes that led to Cyber Utopia in this universe, to move Cybertron throughout the Functionist universe in space and time, attacking other inhabited worlds and purging all other life, for- life forms. But when Cybertron was just a mobile planet, worlds could still evacuate when they saw Cybertron coming. So the Functionist Council reformatted Cybertron to have a second mode and become a giant mechanoid that could catch and destroy everything within reach. The Council then merged with Vector Sigma at the planet's core so they could control Cybertron's robot form directly. Megatron and the AVL on the last light tried to keep one step ahead and warn planets to escape before the Functionists arrive saving the lives they could. But Ultra Magnus still doesn't understand. It's only been three or four weeks since they left Megatron in the Functionist universe. There's no way all this could have happened in that short time. But Megatron explains that since Cybertron has been using the Warren, it's been moving backwards and forwards in space and time. At this point, Megatron's actually been fighting the Functionists for centuries. Now that everyone's caught up, there's still the question of how to deal with the giant fanatical Primus monster robot. Grimlock's got the easy solution, blow it up. Surprisingly, the Magnificence agrees that they're destined to blow it up. However, they still need Rodimus, Ratchet, and Rung, who are back on the World Sweeper, in addition to Tailgate, who's already there. But Megatron disagrees. Despite the fact that Functionist Cybertron has turned into a giant killer robot, it's still populated by billions of living Cybertronians. If they destroy the monster robot, they'll kill all the innocent civilians still trapped on the planet. Back on the World Sweeper, everyone is trying to process the Grand Architect's revelation. He's actually Adaptus, one of the Guiding Hand, the original five gods of Cybertron. The symbol Rodimus and the Lost Light were chasing that they thought represented the Knights of Cybertron is actually Adaptus's sigil. But of course, as Rodimus and crew have already discovered, the Knights of Cybertron weren't real. They were just a myth that grew out of the original Cybertronian ex- explorers who left Cybertron and eventually ended up on Madiri. Rodimus winces at being reminded again of his failure. But Adaptus says they actually didn't fail after all. They didn't find the Knights of Cybertron, but on their quest, they did find all the members of the Guiding Hand. Rodimus scoffs that he doesn't remember running into the other four Cybertronian gods, but Adaptus explains that they've all forgotten who they were. Mortalus, the god of death, took the name Sensir and became known to everyone else as the Necrobot. Chief Justice Tyrest, with his skills for negotiation and mediation, was originally the god of wisdom, Solomus. Earlier, Adaptus saw that Nickel was carrying Epistemus, the god of knowledge, now known as the Magnificence, around her neck. And World points out that the last god, Primus, is currently a giant planet trying to murder them. But Adaptus says, no, that's not the real Primus. Primus is, and always has been, that small, unassuming bot who's been with them all along. Wrong. To be continued... Yeah, this uh, for me, I, I this was a fun issue. I I really I thought it was it was pretty. Uh, I mean, for being the, like the middle chapter of this big epic, it was very exposition heavy. It was kind of a you know pretty much a info dump. But I really liked that that reveal at the end. I mean, uh, I think. Um, James Roberts. So this this reminds me of James Roberts' previous fanfic story, uh, Eugenesis, because uh, Eugenesis uh, also explored. I mean, it was it was focused on the Marvel UK comics, but it explored the idea that Primus and Unicron they were represented as gods in those comics, but then that myth turned out to be have a more like I would say I guess scientific or naturalistic explanation. 
this is a, a similar idea is that the gods of Cybertron are not actually gods. They just turned out to be very, very old Cybertronians that ever, that due to that, the idea that uh, Cybertronians can periodically forget, uh, you know, since they live so long, they might forget their, uh, their memories and they can forget who they were even. So it just felt like that was a really interesting, uh, revelation and i'm i'm wondering it was it's just a really neat payoff for me i enjoyed it you know the of course the question is whether or not this this was really what james roberts has been planning all along um i thought just thinking back uh back to way back in issue two or three of more than meets the eye when rung was identified to have the brightest spark on the ship that's that seems to be an interesting uh tidbit that that uh this reminded me of I just thought it was a it was a a good issue. I thought uh, also uh, I glossed over some of it, but the humor of the um, uh, the scavengers uh, being starstruck by Megatron, and then uh, Swerve and Swerve and uh, Misfire having a little bit of injecting a little bit of humor in the issue was fun too. And uh, the whole pharma thing was also interesting. How uh, you know he was actually merged with Adaptus. So I thought it was uh, I, I you know I, I thought it was a a good nice meaty issue so i will throw it over to daryl who will completely <laughs> disagree with me so go ahead daryl <laughs> yeah i didn't uh, i didn't like it uh not all that much anyway first of all i'll start with a positive i liked seeing megatron back he is one character out of the lost light run that uh, i have enjoyed the character arc of megatron has been fun so it was nice to see megatron back the art had me thrown a bit. I, I I didn't mind the art. I think I thought it looked good. But I'm looking at all the pictures uh, where all the frames where Ty Rest is in, and he doesn't appear to have any holes in him anymore. He has some in his chest, not so much on his head. Yeah, so, I mean, where are they? Like, this guy was supposed to be all hole, holed up, and he had that one right in the center of his forehead. You know, that was a very you know, prominent spot for one of those. And those are all just gone. Well, maybe the grand architect repaired him after he rescued him from Luna one. I don't know. Must have. I mean, I think even, even as recently as the last issue, I think he still had the one on his forehead. Oh, just changed it up off, off panel. So whatever. So that's different. I'm trying to remember. I don't recall when, um, what the bots' names were when the Magnificence just said the four names or whatever that needed to, that it needed. It was the, it was the same names mentioned in this issue: Rung, Ratchet, Rodimus, and Tailgate. So are they the ones? Are they the, of the of the ones that are left on the ship? So only only Rung, Ratchet, and Rodimus are on the World Sweeper. Tailgate is with everyone else on the Last Light with Megatron. Okay. Not so the Magnificent is on the last light. Yeah. Right. As far as the whole everything is, uh, uh, everyone's a god and you, nobody ever knew, I call BS on that. The uh, It's just something to to kind of say here in the, in the the at the end of the, the story because the, uh, the, the guiding hand or whatever turned out to be such a flop of a, of a story. Having, having this kind of be the, the, something that was seated at the very start of the series uh, is uh, is something that I don't buy. He's got, what, three issues left to pull this all together? We'll see. Well, I mean, my my thought is that, uh, and this is similar to, like, what they're doing with the, like, what they, what John Barber did with the 13 in, in, the, uh, in the other series, is that when you say they're, like, gods, they're not really gods. There's... They were just really, really old bots. So that's how I interpreted it, that they're not actually gods. And that's why it's a, uh, that all the myths and legends that you're told were not, you know, the truth is not, is not, does not live up to the myth. Yeah, I mean, they're just really old. And we have seen that Rung has been in, like, he's been around almost every significant point in Cybertronian history. I mean, there was that, issue of um, more than meets the eye where they were like trying to get like wake rung up after was it after his head was blown off or something. And I think, you know, I think there was like that big chart and you could see like he basically at every significant point in their, in their past rung had just kind of been there. 
So I mean, that that kind of makes sense. Oh, well, we did call the the magnificence being a pessimist like earlier, like when when the magnificence first started coming back. I think we we worked that out. Um, I'm not I'm not fully convinced that all of this was pre-planned, but uh, <clears throat> we'll see what happens in the last three issues. I don't know uh, these 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 issues that are are that are just like exposition heavy are are not my cup of tea. And then these kind of issues are becoming more and more frequent on Lost Light. So I'm I'm kind of I'm just happy it's uh, it's going to be over soon because <laughs> it's because <laughs> I, I I am I personally I don't like the book very much anymore. So I'll be just happy when it's over. It sounds bad, I know, but I, it's it's becoming a book that I'm not I'm not happy to read anymore. Um, it's just it's it's a it's a Transformers story. Yeah, I get it. It's just it's not it's not fun to read for me. Anyway, no, that's, that's enough that's for me. Fa- yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, for me, it's the uh, the payoff of the, all the you know six years of stories is what I'm what I'm looking forward to. By the way, I am looking at Lost Light Twenty One, and Tyrese does not have a hole in his head. Entire in issue twenty one, he does okay. still have holes in his chest, but the hole in his head has been fixed. So that's probably why he's. I mean, he does seem a lot more rational than he did way back in the early issues of More Than Meets the Eye when he was kind of crazy. Any explanation? Well, I mean, the Grand the Architect world. rescued him and fixed him. That's you know that's why he's here serving the Grand Architect. So I'd say that's he, the explanation. He had the hole in his head prior to or post being rescued and fixed. Well, he didn't. I mean, at least looking at these issues, I don't see a hole in his head in the previous issue. Well, 19, he was still there. He was he was there and fixed or, or rescued, right? Does he have a, the, do you have a picture from I, Lost Light 19? I, not on me, but he <laughs> as of as of recently, he has been he has had that hole in his head. It's not I remember on a review though. I asked about them. Yeah, I would say off off panel he got fixed with no explanation. Yeah. A wizard did it. Anytime you notice anything like that, a wizard did it. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, Jeremy, we should get your thoughts. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the book, too. It it has a lot of the humor that has been missing that I liked. Um, I really like that Megatron just painted the ship purple because it's a good color. <laughs> it's clearly his favorite <laughs> color. Like we were talking about before, the, the payoff of a lot of the the long-term stories, I'm, I'm enjoying that. I am surprised that Grimlock was okay being in the same room as Megatron, but I think it was when Moonbase 2 was talking about the book, um, they mentioned that they don't they haven't really ever interacted like that we've seen. So, you know, maybe this Grimlock just doesn't have the same animosity, especially with all he's been through. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the time travel stuff is kind of interesting where Megatron has had now centuries worth of being an Autobot. So like, you know, Magnus still hasn't gotten over the fact that just weeks ago from their, their perspective, Megatron just, uh, you know, abandoned them mm-hmm. when we know that the ship or they, they left without Megatron and he's continued to do as good as he could in, in the Functionist universe. I've, I really like that. And, I mean, I, to me, this was just a, an enjoyable book. I'm I'm not – I don't have a problem with the reveal of Rung being Primus. My real issue is going to be more what is Tailgate's role because Tailgate being so overpowered has – I don't know. I, I haven't really enjoyed that very much. I mean, I liked it at the mm-hmm. beginning. It was It was funny. And then – it just seems like it's something that should have gone away. So I'm curious as to why Tailgate is so important in the magnificent list of, of characters that are important. Well, he he shouldn't be, like, didn't, I mean, we, we still don't have an explanation for how he is still alive. Like, the last we saw, he was buried in that, in that bunker to depower him. Everyone mm-hmm. said he was dead, but then he showed up on Madiri and was, is back alive, and we still and have no explanation disappear. for that. Yeah. yeah. So he might already be depowered, but for some reason he's still important. But yeah. So I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, we got three issues left, so I, I'm excited to see where it's going to go, and 
I'm wondering what the time difference between this and what's happening with like Unicron and stuff, you know, how that's going to play into things. Mm -hmm. Because as of right now, this is chronologically way behind. Yep. Also, uh, we do get, it's a little, it's one thing that was a little bit kind of, at least a, I don't know if I would say disappointing or just kind of a little bit of an oomph, you know, kind of hit me in the gut is that, you have just one little panel of dialogue where the, the Functionist Council talks about how they've basically murdered all of Megatron's friends in the Functionist universe. So, you know, Megatron comes back. He's got he's lead, he's on this la the ship, the last light. Where's Terminus? Dead. Uh, did Megatron meet up with Orion Pax in the Functionist universe, that version of Optimus Prime? Yes, but he's dead. <laughs> Rung on the, the version of Rung in the Functionist universe. Also dead. Uh, Night Stalker, that's a character, uh, who was, uh, a, uh, a bot who was actually, a, um, the same, uh, body shape as Ravage from the old G1 UK comics, but he's also dead, so don't worry about it if you don't recognize Night Stalker. Um, and Impactor, the version of Impactor from the Functionist Universe, who was Megatron's friend back in the day, back when he was just a minor, he's also dead. <laughs> So, yeah, if you were looking to see how Megatron got along in the Functionist universe and whether he met up with all his old friends, he did, but they're all dead. <laughs> pour out pour out one for <laughs> all the Functionist universe versions of your favorite characters. Uh, yeah, I also I, I didn't mention the art. I also enjoyed the art. Brendan Cahill's art is is a is a you know, he 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 doesn't get a didn't get to do a lot of issues of of more than meets the eye and lost light. But I think every one he did was was really good. So this one was uh was up to his usual uh his usual talent so mm -hmm. i was glad to see him on the issue and joanna la fuente of course always brings the consistent colors and makes it look uh makes uh you know w regardless of the artist makes makes the book look consistent so especially all the you know the the scale of the primus shattering planets uh i think brendan did a good job with that I guess that's it for more than meets the or no, not more than meets the eye. I, I guess that's, <laughs> I guess that's it for Lost Light number twenty two, uh, and <laughs> of course, last week in August, uh, Lost Light is still behind because twenty three was supposed to come out in August and it's not coming. So <laughs> hopefully next week, first week in September, we'll see. But IDW. <laughs> Are you going to make that October uh, October end date for all your books? We'll see. All right, let's move on to some Transformers media news. All right, in media news this week, we've got beta builds and deleted levels from the Transformers 2007 video game. Um, if uh, you played this game and uh, ever wanted to know if there was anything left out, there was. Uh, so take a look. There's a video here provided by Game Hut from YouTube, and they show some uh, some stuff that was uh, taken out of the game. Also, we've got uh, some stuff for the Bumblebee the Movie Worldwide Promo Tour. It has begun, and or it is beginning in September. Uh, first stop will be Comic Con Portugal. It will be on September the sixth to the 9th. And then it'll go on from there to Heroes Comic Con in Madrid, Spain. From then on to other points around the world. Go and take a look at that if that's something no you're. If it'll be showing up at the TF Con in Chicago, Illinois. I doubt it. Probably not. <laughs> Entertainment Weekly. How legendary voice actor Frank Welker brought characters to life. Uh, I did watch this video. This was pretty cool. Um, it's a nice little video with Frank, and uh, he talks about how he's been with uh, Scooby-Doo since the very start, 1966, which is insane, and then also goes into uh, how, he, uh, how he created uh, the character voice for Megatron. He does, uh, he does both voices. Uh, on the uh, video and uh, you get to hear them there. It's not a long video. I think it's what, two and a half minutes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. He's being uh, honored. Um, I guess is that uh, he has been honored. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty cool video. I, anything with uh, Frank Welker is pretty great because he's a, uh, he's a living legend. Also over on entertainment weekly, uh, we get a new video for transformers cyberverse. So we're look. it's a new trailer. 
yeah, it's uh, showing a little, quick little one minute video about uh, the new cartoon that's coming out. And uh, yeah, a lot of bunch of clips here. And you get to see some new uh, images, one of them showing Optimus Prime and what he's going to look like in this show. So take a look at that. Boo to the mouth. Should not have <laughs> a mouth. Mm. Everything else looks great, but boo to the mouth. Trailer is also available on YouTube. On Cartoon Network, on the Cartoon Network app, the show will be available to watch on August the 22nd in the U.S. 27th. only. Or 27th, sorry. And an air date in the America on video on demand and Cartoon Network September the 1st. So if folks in the U.S. with the Cartoon Network app, you should be able to watch it right now. First episode, episode only, I think. Is that what yeah. you're... Yeah. 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 Might be set for a specific time. But, uh, and also we've got uh, a new Cyberverse clip. This was um, not available for me. It's uh, uh, location locked, but uh, it's uh, called Memories of the Allspark. So take a look at that. We also got a main cast. So this was something that we've been kind of looking for because we haven't been able to get any information on who's going to be in the show. The only thing we really kind of had was who was going to play uh, one of the Decepticon jets. And actually, their name isn't on the Shadow Striker. It's not that person. It's not? No, I thought it was, but it's not. Um, so Autobots, uh, Bumblebee is voiced by Jeremy Levy, uh, Windblade, Sophia Isabella, Optimus Prime, Jake Tillman, Grimlock, Ryan Andes, the Decepticons, Megatron, Mark Thompson. Starscream, Billy Bob Thompson, Shockwave, Ryan Andes. So he's double dutying at this uh, show with uh, Grimlock as well. And Shadow Striker, Deanna McGovern. I think you were thinking of Slipstream. That's the one who's missing. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Slipstream is the other one. We yeah. also don't see anything for Thundercracker either. Yeah. I, th I think that a lot of those are going to be, you know, one or two episode characters. Daryl and I were talking before the show and I was saying how Mark Thompson, I recognized his name. If you've ever listened to a Star Wars audiobook, he is like the main uh, narrator for all the Star Wars audiobooks, like going back years. He, he does he does a lot of different voices when he's doing those books and I'm looking forward to seeing him as Megatron. Interesting. Well, the clips that we've seen so far, he's doing a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Yeah, this for... show looks. Oh, OK. Go oh, I, was, I was just going to say this show looks like all everything I've seen from this show has me excited. I mean, I, I it looks really like they're they're doing a really good homage to past Transformers law lore in particular G1. I mean, it looks like they're even drawing from the IDW comics and that you have, you know, Optimus Prime and Megatron being friends beforehand and then having some kind of schism that leads to the war and it has me excited. I mean, th I've been, this is the most I've been excited for a new Transformers show in a while. So I'm looking forward to it. And the animation is really nice. It's bright. You like bright colors. Yes. Bright, shiny things. Keep me distracted. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's uh, it for media news this week. All right. And let's move on to some transforming pop culture. All right, so uh, I thought this was interesting because uh, this was a, in a couple of articles that were from The Independent, uh, which is a, uh, a magazine in the UK. Uh, so the writer David Barnett wrote an article back in July about how uh, boys are always collecting stuff and toys and why, why is, is collecting particularly a male centric hobby and why do only men collect all this random junk and uh after he put this article up lots of people on twitter chimed in to say you don't know what you're talking about and that men are not the only ones who collect stuff women, lots of women collect stuff and in particular lots of transformers fans got on to say yo i am a woman i like transformers and i collect transformers and you don't know what you're talking about what I thought was interesting about this was, you know, normally the Internet being the Internet, this article would get published. People on Twitter would give angry responses. The writer would not reply to them and that would be it. But the writer actually went back and wrote a second article following up saying, yeah, I was wrong. 
and women do collect stuff and, you know, I should not have excluded them. Uh, and the interesting thing about his follow-up article is that he took the advice of the Transformers fans and actually checked out TF Nation. He posted, he published in the, in the follow-up article tweets from uh, lots of the Transformers collectors and of course, uh, Mikey, uh, he was tweeting under the Moonbase 2 account, but I'm pretty sure it was Mikey because he was throwing in a lot of scientific stuff with talking about <laughs> biology and, you know, he, uh, you know, how how the animal kingdom works and everything. And uh, and he got quoted in the article, too. So I just thought that was really cool. Good job, Mikey, for setting this guy straight. And uh, I, I just thought it was really interesting, in particular, uh, that the uh, the hook was the Transformers fans and the and the female Transformers fans that got the spotlight in his follow up article. So I just thought that was cool and gave some uh, good press to TF Nation too. So. Yes, good job, guys. Yep. All right, so uh, let's finish up. Or no, yeah, no, yes, yeah, yes. <laughs> let's <laughs> let me start over. That that one's for you, Mike. <laughs> Let's finish up the show with some convention news. All right. Um, we have some TFCon Chicago announcements. Uh, the first one is uh, Transformers artist Sarah Petra de Roche is going to be attending. Uh, she's obviously done uh, Till All Are One, among another or a n- number of different comics for um, IDW. Uh, I think she recently did, was it Optimus Prime? Yes, uh, one of the recent Optimus Prime issues. You're right. So yeah, a couple I mean, of them. Yeah, and, and she's done also like some of the the packaging art for Combiner Wars. I mean, she's she's got a new a number of amazing styles, and um, it'll be great seeing her again. And she'll be selling her stuff. I'm sure she'll have commission information up, you know, pretty soon because it's we're getting close to the convention now. And next we have um, Alec Willows is going to be attending TFCon Chicago. He was the voice of Tarantulas in Beast Wars. And I have never seen him at a, a convention before, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's been to Transformer conventions. He doesn't go to many. He was at uh, TFCon... Last year. Yeah, la- CFCon Toronto. Toronto last year. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay. So you were at a convention I, with I was. Him, Jeremy. Okay, I just I didn't go to the panel. I was a little busy. But the, the Tarantulas has one of those really distinctive, creepy voices, and it's it'll be great seeing him. And also, I'm wondering since since of the Wreckers has come out and Tarantulas played a, a big role in that. I wonder if if he's even aware of that. And I'm I'm sure people will bring his, the book to him. I'm looking forward to checking out any panels he's on and, and, you know, meeting him and saying hi, because Tarantulas was one of those characters I really liked. And finally, um, K-Girl, probably official artist of the Transmissions podcast, or, you know, she's, she created our logo. She uh, created some art that we sent out to our Donatrions last year. She has put on Twitter a couple of prints that she's going to be having at TFCon Chicago. I believe she said that she's going to have a table. It'll be um, really great seeing her there. And if you want to check out, uh, she's got one of, of Grimlock basically bursting through the page and then one of the DJD. You know, they look really good. So, you know, check them out and be sure to buy it from her at the show. Mm-hmm. We also have news from TF Nation. Uh, they just finished their convention and they have announced TF Nation The Gathering. This will be social meetups throughout the year that are going to be free to attend and they're meant for people to meet and socialize. So if you met people at at the big convention, you can meet back up with them. Or if you've never been to a convention, it's meant to give someone a a taste of what a a convention actually is, you know, kind of a try before you're by type thing. The first uh, one will be on Saturday, October 6th in London at, the Pendrels Oak Weatherspoon in the Holborn area of London. And they say just to ask the staff to direct you to the area that's reserved for the TF Nation group. Uh, we'll have a link in our show notes to their blog post with map and more information. But I think this is a really neat idea. And I believe the UK has a history of these like area meets of Transformer fans. So it's nice to see kind of a more 
official thing that's tied into a convention. What do you think about that, Daryl? Do you think TF or TFCon should do something like that? I, I'd be for it. Yeah. When, I, yeah, a little I, bit harder in Canada or the U.S. We're we're spread out quite a yeah. bit. Yeah. The uh, when I first heard about this, I was like, oh, it's for all those people that uh, that meet up for uh, you know and have one uh, you know one night flings at the uh, convention. Now they can meet up uh, a few times a year and have flings. <laughs> not exactly. Oh. But who knows? I mean, we're, we're not we're not here to judge. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not <laughs> British. I don't know how they do it. Yeah, but sounds um, fun. <laughs> yeah, but one thing I did see online, even though it is meeting at a pub, they're not saying you have to drink. Um, I know there's a number of of people that don't drink for whatever reason, like me. It, yeah, <laughs> or I mean, it's just a place that they chose, and you know, I think personally, I'm not a big drinker, and I like to right. Drink. Well, every every uh, every corner's got a pub. Yeah, I so. believe it's called Rovers Tavern. Is it? In England, no. Rovers Tavern. I've never heard of that. That's a that's a joke for anybody that knows uh, long running British soap opera. No, see, I, we have been away from being subject to the crown for much longer than you. So I, I don't. It's true. <laughs> but uh, let's move on. We have some TF Con, some more TF Con news that um, our our friend Jimmers, who is a donatrion of of our show, uh, he runs Distortion Productions, which put out the, the Respect the Prime albums, which were the, um, the I guess, kind of cover albums of, of the 86 I movie soundtrack. That, yeah, I would agree to that. Yeah, from industrial and electronic bands, and it, it goes to his uh, Electronic Saviors charity, which is for cancer research. He's been promising that they're going to make it more than just that one album. And now he's announced Respect the Prime Constructed Cold EP is going to be released at TFCon Chicago on October 26th. It's a limited edition CD and then a digital release is going to follow. There's six tracks, um, although this isn't finalized. So what what he announced is uh, Panic Lift featuring Red Locust, which is Jimmer's band has a track called Constructed Cold. And these are all inspired by by the comics. So this is inspired by the Death of Optimus Prime one shot and more than ECI number one. A tragic Impulse has a, a track called Kill Switch that's inspired by the Remain in Light arc and more than ECI. Doors in the Labyrinth has a track called Scrounge's Lament inspired by Marvel issue 17. And I think I'm already, that's my favorite. Because I don't know, Scrounge is, is a recent favorite character. Boxed Warning has a track called Losing the Light, inspired by More Than Me CI, number 28 through 33. Thought Form has a track called The Empyrean Suite, inspired by More Than Me CI, number 7 and 8. And The Empyrean Suite is something that was referenced in the books. I'm wondering if they actually, I think there were some notes in some of the, the panels. I'm wondering if... if Anything from the comic musically actually made it into there, or they're just figuring out what they thought it would be. And then Red Locust has a track called Letters from Grindcore, inspired by More Than Me CI number 48 and 49. So that is pretty awesome. The catalog number on this is DST040. I'm not sure if you can use that with like your own record store to order it, but we will be sure to talk to Jimmers. If not before the show, we're definitely going to talk to him at the show. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we're gonna try and see if we can get a preview of some of this. Cause I, yeah, I, I like I like this. It sounds great. Yeah. Um, the first CD sounded fantastic. Obviously, mm-hmm. the music was very uh, recognizable, you know, because it yeah. was covers. But uh, I'm interested in 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 uh, hearing what these uh, these groups have done with the these uh, inspired by songs. Yeah. You know, they get a chance to express themselves, plus uh, use the uh, the material that uh, we've we've come to to know and love. Yeah, it is kind of interesting. It's like all more than meets the eye pretty much, except for the the one about Scrounge. Mm -hmm. Nothing robots in the skies. But I guess political or politics doesn't really play well with making music unless it's Mm going to be more of a a march or something. Yeah, no Lost Light either. Well, yeah. So that is everything we got this week. So I guess that's the show. All right. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Later. Thanks for listening to Transmissions. 
Remember, you can help support the show by donating to us directly via Patreon or PayPal. Once you become a donor, you will receive access to donor-only goodies, like donor-only contests, listening to us record transmissions live, and getting transmission swag at 20% off. You can find links for this at transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Subscribing to us on Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Play is also a great way to support us here at Transmissions. Every subscription we get helps us get better noticed on those services. Leaving us a comment and five-star review doesn't hurt either. Be sure to come chat with us on Discord. You will find a link for Discord at transmissionspodcast.com slash Discord. And of course, you can always send us an email at feedback at transmissionspodcast.com. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again next week.